Well, hello everyone and welcome. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. So first of all, a, a few housekeeping things. So I wanna make sure just like at a conference that you're in the right room. This is a webinar for what you're interested in. So this is a webinar to uh, prepare an application for the North Central Region SARES Research and Education Grant Program. Uh, and this is the pre-proposal process. And the North Central Region is, are the upper 12 Midwestern states of the United States. So if you are looking to do sustainable agriculture research in that primarily affects those upper 12 North uh, Midwest states, you are in the right spot. Uh, and this is for 2023 research and education uh, funding and our this research and education grant program is a competitive grant program that funds collaborative teams of scientists, farmers, institutions, and educators exploring sustainable agriculture through research projects or education demonstration projects. Um, and I'm just going to start off with a few housekeeping items. So I am Beth Nelson. I am the regional coordinator for the North Central SARE region. And I also coordinate specifically the research and education grant program. Uh, Shannon Osborne has also joined us today. She's one of our administrative council members and she is the technical committee chair. So she oversees the process of review of the full proposals. And as you'll see, um, are, is involved as well with the pre-proposal review process. And then uh, helping out today, Marie Flanagan is hosting uh, along with Aaron Schneider. So they're gonna help uh, get questions answered. We have quite a few people signed up for this, uh, this webinar today. And so I am going to ask you to put your questions in the chat. Uh, you can also unmute and ask them at the end. We're gonna hold questions till I run through uh, this first set of slides. Um, you can enter your questions in the chat and then uh, Marie will funnel those to me at the end or you can unmute at the end, but let's, let's hold them uh, till the end if possible. So first I'm gonna go through some overview slides about the SARE program, kind of give you an idea of what our philosophy is uh, to see if your idea might fit well with our program and with our goals and objectives. Um, after I get through those, and I'm gonna race through those pretty quickly because these same, the same presentation is also on the website with the notes um, as a PDF. And that's in the same spot where you'll download the call for proposals for this grant program. So I am gonna kind of race through the slides. Marie is also recording this webinar, so you can go back and, and look at that as well. Um, after I've been through those overview slides, Shannon is going to join, uh, is going to give you maybe some tips and ideas of uh, things that she has seen over the years um, as she's looked at pre-proposals and full proposals. And then uh, we'll answer questions, uh, the general questions about applying. And then for those of you who aren't familiar with the online proposal application system. I'll have Marie pull that up at the end. Those of you are, who are familiar can, can uh, end, but the rest of you who wanna see what the application uh, online actually looks like, we can open that up for you. So that is the plan. And with that, I am just gonna go ahead and dive, dive in. So Marie, if you can move to the next slide. Um, so SARE is the Sustainable Ag Research and Education Grant Program. Uh, we've been around for over 30 years and uh, we are funded by the USDA. We are part of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture or NIFA. You can go to the next slide. So our mission statement for SARE is that we provide grants and outreach to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture. So right off the bat, you see that we cover a whole lot of topics. That's a very broad charge. Uh, you can move on to the next one, Marie. So we are a different kind of a grant program in some ways. Uh, we are decentralized and that means that the North Central region, so again, those 12 upper Midwestern states 
are governed by an administrative council that decides what our priorities are going to be within the scope of overall SARE. We are science-based, but we are also very strongly a grassroots funding group, and we fund farmer-driven research. So that means that we look at problem-solving, practical applications of the research. And I'll just add that while we know basic research is critical, that's not what this grant program funds. So we really are looking for solutions to problems that farmers have brought up that, are, that could be implemented in the field within the next few years. Um, so those are the kinds of things that fit the SARE grant program. You can go to the next slide. So I did want to just briefly mention that we're not just a grant funding program, although that is our main purpose. National SARE puts out uh, bulletins, which are free, as well as some really great publications that are low cost books that you can order online. You can look for that by going to SARE.org. And I will just say about the bulletins that if you teach classes, uh, or do workshops that those technical those bulletins can be ordered. Uh, you can order multiple copies of those so that you could use them in your classroom. So I just wanted to make you aware of those resources. Uh, go ahead, Marie. So all SARE projects need to address um, three aspects of sustainability. And I know you're all familiar with with those, so people, profit, and protection of the nation's land and water. So you'll see in the, even at the pre-proposal level, one of the first things you have to do is consider how your project will address our outcomes for social, environmental, and economic aspects of sustainability. You can go on to the next slide. I will say that for scientists, uh, we are sometimes challenged by the social sustainability aspect. And so National SARE has put some effort lately into trying to think through and develop resources to help both applicants and reviewers uh, think about what does it mean? What are the impacts of social sustainability? What kind of outcomes would we have? And maybe even how do we measure those? So we have a new resource online. There's a link to that. Uh, and this is just the graphic for it. It actually goes through some of those a little bit more. And so if you're having trouble thinking about social outcomes for the work you're doing, uh, that might be a good resource for you to look at. Next slide. I mentioned that we have a broad charge. And so we fund uh, proposals in a broad, broad range of topics. So uh, integrated or sustainable pest and weed management, water quality, crop diversification, marketing, urban agriculture. Uh, we cover a lot of territory. Next slide. We are the North Central region. And so we're that part that's marked in kind of that yellow color there. That's the North Central region of SARE. Thanks for the, thanks for the graphic help there, Marie. Um, so if you are in one of those 12 upper Midwest states, you can apply to this program. We do accept applications within the United States outside of our region, as long as they primarily affect the North, sustainable agriculture in the North Central region. If you have questions about that, um, please call me. I, I did also want to mention that we have other grants. And in fact, four of our grant programs are open right now. The Farmer Rancher Program goes directly to fund innovative ideas on someone's farm or ranch. It goes directly to farmers and ranchers. Uh, the Youth Educator One supports um, youth educators who are giving sustainable uh, ag information to young adults or youth. Uh, and then our professional, uh, uh, sorry, our partnership grant program is also open. And I'm gonna say a little bit more at the, at the end because I think that program in particular might be of interest to the same group of people who are considering applying for the research and education grant program. So you can go on to the next slide. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the specifics for the research and education grant program. So this is our largest grant program. We have grants for up to $250,000. Uh, we do allow 10% indirect costs. They can go for up to 36 months. Uh, there is often an opportunity to get a no cost extension for an additional year, uh, but the application can't be for longer than 36 months. We do have, it's not quite so new anymore. I think this is our third year of offering our long-term funding option. I'll say a little bit more about that later. That's basically for projects that cannot be completed uh, within that typical three or four timeline. And the funding's a little complicated. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but if you're interested in that aspect, I'd suggest you, you call me and we can talk about whether your project fits that or not. The projects that, get, uh, that you apply for here can be research or education projects or demonstration projects. The proposals are due October 13th at four o'clock central daylight time. So note that earlier time. Um, so that is when the proposal system closes. We don't have technical support after that. So it needs to be in by, by uh, four o'clock central time on Thursday, October 13th. We invite 30 to 35 pre-proposals and we have funding for 15 to 16. We typically get about 150 pre-proposals in this program. So it is a pretty tough cut. The funds from this program are a bit, because it's a pre-proposal process, it takes a little while. So the funds are available for this uh, mid-fall 2023. You can go to the next slide, Marie. So these pre-proposals are, are reviewed by, mostly by members of our administrative council. We have a few um, other people that brought, that uh, help us to review, partly because we get so many in and they also fill out our expertise and, and topic needs. They are scored on relevance to sustainable agriculture in our region. They're, they're, we look at the methods and approach, but we don't really expect great detail at this point. You'll see in the word limits that you don't have space to put in great detail. Mostly the reviewers are looking to see if they think your method or your approach will lead to the results you want to get in the project, if it's an appropriate approach. And then they also look at farmer engagement and farmer engagement is not just giving uh, you know, giving a talk to farmers. It's actually bringing them into your research. It doesn't have to be on farm research, but it should be engaging them in talking about the research. Uh, maybe you have an advisory committee or something like that. We divide them into these groups based uh, loosely on expertise and topic, and then the administrative, the, the groups will recommend ones to move forward and invite for full proposals. And I'll talk a little bit more about the timeline for that in a later slide. Go ahead, Marie. So successful pre-proposals demonstrate relevance to the North Central region. So, you know, how, how does this apply to the work that is happening in these upper 12 Midwestern states? They address NCR SARE's three broad-based outcomes, and you'll see those are written in the call for proposals. But as you can imagine, again, those affect profit, people, and planet or, or environmental outcomes. And really importantly, they involve farmers and ranchers in the project. And I say that over and over again, because that's what's maybe a little bit different about SARE. You must have farmers and ranchers involved in your project. You can go to the next slide. They have clear outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit about what outcomes are and give some examples later. So outcomes are not necessarily the scientific results you're going to get from your proposal, but it's what you expect to happen as a result of your proposal. So often those outcomes are going to come from your outreach and your education, your sharing of the information of what you've discovered. Um, so, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Go ahead, Marie. 
This is the actual uh, pre-proposal application. So it is an online submission and the link is in the call for pre-proposals. Uh, for those of you who came into the summit webinar later, uh, at the end, um, we'll go ahead, Marie's gonna go ahead and open that up so you can see what that system looks like. Uh, we do suggest that you prepare a Word document first. It just helps you know how what your word limits are and that type of thing. And it also uh, will give you a chance, and then you can cut and paste it into the online system. Next slide. So we just wanna say a, a, something quick about the long-term funding. So you, there is a checkbox in the pre-proposal for indicating that you are applying under the long-term option. Those pre-proposals will be reviewed by a separate committee and they're going to look at whether this is applicable under all the other criteria, but also they'll look at whether this fits their long-term funding criteria. And you really need a very strong justification uh, for asking for long-term funding. We get our funding allotments in uh, five-year increments. So we cannot fund a project for longer than three or four years. And then we have to write a new contract. So the idea with this is you would do a first cycle and then you would come back and get funding for a second cycle without having to go through the application process again. So we recognize that there are some projects that take long enough to set up that you will have no results at the end of those three or four years. And this long-term option is designed for those kinds of projects. We know that nearly every research project leads to more questions that could be answered with another set of funding, but those should just come through the typical system. These really are for ones that can only be done by getting funding for longer than three or four years. And again, I would say if you want to apply for that, please contact me uh, and we can talk about it and see whether that fits for your idea. You can go to the next slide, Marie. So there are a couple of things that I always tell people when they call me about applying for the research and education grant program. The first one I've already said several times, engage farmers and ranchers. The second one is download uh, and read the call for proposals. Um, we give a lot of the information in the online application, but there's more information in the call for proposals. So please download that. You'll see in this slide, the call was not listed in the system yet. It is now there. And so you can go to uh, the website, northcentralsera.org and download the call for proposals. And as I said, this uh, webinar will also be in that same spot, both the recorded webinar, as well as a PDF of these slides with the notes. Um, so you can use that as a tool as well for your application. Next slide, Marie. We do have some uh, resources for applying for a grant uh, that you can look up as well on our North Central SARE website, so be sure to check those out. Next slide. This is another uh, main thing you should do in preparing for proposal. So our all of our projects are on project, all of the reports from past projects from the past 30 years are in at this website, projects.sare.org. You search for projects and you can search by keywords and look at past SARE projects to see how your work differs or builds on past projects. And I find that reviewers really like that when you do that, especially at the pre-proposal level. So uh, if you know, they would tend to say, well, this has been done before, but you've said, well, this was done in this region, but we're, you know, we have much lower rainfall or something like that. It really uh, is impactful. So I would suggest that you look up past SARE projects um, to see what's been done in this area already. Next slide. And then this is another very important resource for you that you should take advantage of. So each of our states uh, has someone who does outreach for SARE, each of our 12 upper Midwest states, I should say. 
And if you go to the North Central SARE website, click on that state coordinators one, you'll, you'll get the contact information for the person in your state. I will answer general questions about your proposal, but your state coordinator often can do a lot of things like maybe connect you to others working in that area, connect you to farmers or ranchers who are working in that area. And some of them uh, will really talk through your ID, even look over maybe a draft of your proposal if they have time. So definitely be in touch with your state coordinator to talk about your idea and your pre-proposal as you develop it. Next slide. So I'm just gonna again quickly run through the actual aspects of the online proposal application. So the cover material is you know, pretty general information. We do like to know whether your project is gonna focus on socially disadvantaged or limited resource farmers. Uh, and as you'll see there, there is uh, a spot for you to check whether you are applying for the long-term funding option. You can go to the next slide, Marie. And then the first set of questions I think that you ask on the application are, you know, how do your project outcomes align with NCR SARE's outcomes? So again, this is where you're looking at the three aspects of sustainability. We understand that your project likely emphasizes one of those over the other two, uh, but you should still give some thought to how, what the, what the outcomes are for those other aspects of sustainability. You can go to the next slide, Marie. So the main part of it is, again, this is fairly typical project summary, uh, your, ob your objectives and your outcomes. And again, I'll give you a little bit more information about um, what your outcomes should look like. Relevance to sustainable agriculture in our region. Again, a great thing to include there is what past projects have done in this area, past SARE projects by going to our data, our uh, reporting system database. And then again, you will give brief information about method and approach. Uh, there is no specific place. There's not a separate attachment. There are no attachments allowed to the proposed, the pre-proposal, I should say. Um, we, we don't expect to have literature citations here, but if you do need to include some critical aspects, if it's a new approach or method, or if it's a revolutionary concept that you want to cite, you can do that within the, within the text, but it is a part of the word limits. You can go to the next one, Marie. Oh, I guess, so what, what I should have mentioned on the last one, you don't need to go back, Marie, because what's not there is a budget. Uh, we do not require a budget at the pre-proposal level. We've done that to shorten it at this point. It's kind of like a long letter of intent. Because we get so many pre-proposal applications, we wanted to make it uh, easier for applicants to kind of vet their idea, see if their concept fits without having to put together a whole budget and all of that. So there is no budget. We do ask you for a range of spending. Uh, just so we have an idea of, of what you're planning to do. So uh, that is something that's a checklist on that cover page as well, but you do not have to complete a budget. I just wanna say a little bit about outcomes. So outcomes, as I've said, are not necessarily the results from research, but it's what you want to happen as a result of you doing your project. And this mostly comes from the, the training or the sharing of information that you do. So if your project is an education project, so that means that the whole three years, you're probably gonna be doing workshops. For example, you're doing post-harvest handling workshops. Um, then you're going to do those workshops and we track learning outcomes and those can happen pretty quickly. So those are things like um, knowledge, awareness, attitude, or skills that have been improved. And those are the kind of things you can document at the end of a workshop. Did I, you know, how many people learned something new? And then there are action outcomes. So that will maybe actually be going in and checking later to see if farmers used the information. Uh, you know, did they make changes to their system? So learning outcomes from this would maybe be farmers will learn post-harvest handling and packing techniques for sales to institutions. And then the action outcome would come from farmers actually increasing their sales to institutions by implementing these practices. So for a research focused project, you can move on to the next slide. 
that may work a little differently because basically what you're doing for two or three years are probably collecting data to come up with research which might lend to rec would lead to recommendations for farmers or ranchers. So really you're going to be doing your outreach mostly at the end of that project. So we would expect your your learning outcomes maybe to be similar that farmers are going to learn what you've discovered through your research. But because it's coming at the end of your two or three years, you may not have time to track action count outcomes from that. So in this example, if you're looking at how uh, diversity um, affects pollinators, the learning outcome might be that they learn which plants to plant or what works the best, but they may not have time to implement that, uh, or you may not be able to track that. In your, in your work. So we just kind of wanted to clarify what we're kind of looking for uh, in terms of learning and action outcomes and what the expectation is. You can go to the next slide. So the other aspects of the pre-proposal, again, it's fairly short, are just kind of listing your team members and their basic expertise. Uh, farmer rancher engagement. Again, how are farmers and ranchers involved in this research? Should they come up with the idea? Are they helping to formulate the treat, you know, think about the treatments? Are they part of an advisory committee? Are they engaged? Are they working with you on the outreach, which is a you know, very effective um, way to do outreach? And then there is a section there, statement regarding resubmitted ideas. So if you have submitted in the past, you've got review comments and you're coming back, that's really a great space to take advantage of how you have addressed the reviews uh, from last time. Uh, and that's another thing that reviewers really look at and find impactful. If uh, you say, well, we were told this, so we've done this differently, or you say, well, we were told this, but here's the reason we did it this way and we think that's a good idea and you convince them, you know, that's a good space for you to do that. And go to the next one. Okay, I think this is one of my last slides. So this is the timeline. Again, they're due uh, online by four o'clock Central Daylight Time on Thursday, October 13th. You'll be notified whether you're invited to submit a full proposal or not in February. The full proposals are due in April. The, the technical committee reviews those full proposals. The administrative council decides which ones to fund in July. And the awards are, you're notified in August and the award offers are sent. And then the budgets get reviewed, the contract gets set up and the funds are not available until November 1st, 2023. So that's a year from now because we have a pre-proposal process. It is a, a long time till the funding is available. Uh, and then there's some reporting requirements on there too. So when reports would be due. So uh, one of the things I'm gonna mention um, about other grant programs. So I told you, you might be interested in the partnership grant program. And we actually have a webinar for applying for that on Monday um, at two o'clock. I'm looking at my calendar. Marie can put that in the chat. Uh, it, the registration for that if you're interested. So the partnership refers to an ag professional working together with three or more farmers to solve a problem. They're $50,000, so they're not as much money, but if you have a scaled down version of your idea that you wanna use, um, that can be a great way to kind of get started, maybe use it as a stepping stone to get an r &E grant or another larger NIFA grant. Uh, so I would suggest you take a look at that call as well to see if that might be something that would work for you. And uh, the success rate in that program in the last couple of years has been about 35%. So we fund about a third of the proposals that come in through the partnership grant program. Those are due a week after these pre-proposals are due. So that's kind of the downside. They're due October 20th and they are a full proposal. They do require a budget. So if you're, you'll have, they'll have to go through your grants office as well. Pre-proposals don't necessarily have to go through your grants office. You'll need to check with them. But if there's not a budget, they often feel they don't need to see them. So, uh, so I would just put in a little plug for thinking about the partnership grant program as well. 
And the last slide is contact information uh, for me. And you are welcome to email me or call me um, to talk about your idea if you have specific questions um, about it. Again, you should also contact your state coordinator. And I'll just add that I am available tomorrow and I'm quite available next week. After that, I have a lot of travel. So uh, if you have some ideas and wanna get in touch next week would be great. Uh, with that, I'm gonna ask Shannon uh, if she wants to jump in. Shannon has been a valued uh, AC member and you can tell a little bit more about uh, your affiliations. Um, for, for many years, we are very lucky to have her. And so she's read a lot of pre-proposals over the years, and I think she'll have some ideas um, for you as a reviewer. Thanks. Can you hear me okay, Beth? Yes. Okay. So um, my name is Shannon Osborne. I am a research agronomist with the USDA ARS in Brookings, South Dakota. And so I have been involved with SARE um, for a long time, <laughs> not sure how long. I was on the technical committee for the r and &E grants first, and then um, reviewing the proposals. And then over the last, I think, six or seven years, I have been on the administrative council as the ARS rep. And now I am the chair of the technical committee um, that oversees these grants. And I guess um, the tips I had as I was listening to um, Beth's proposal was first and foremost, make sure you read the all of the things that come in the call for proposal and read those instructions. And there's a lot of resources on the website for SARE. And um, know that the people who are reviewing the information also have read the full call for proposals and they have access to those same resources. And so we utilize those resources to help us gauge how we are, we are reviewing those proposals. So please take the time to read the instructions, follow the instructions. Um, the staff, Beth, is a great resource um, to bounce ideas off of, ask questions. So make sure that you utilize those things um, as much as you can. Um, also, make sure that your proposal is straightforward and the people who are going to be reviewing your proposal might not be an expert in the area that your proposal is. And so know that the administrative council and the reviewers are made up of people that have a lot of different backgrounds. We have um, soils people, we have horticulturalists, we have producers on the panel. Um, we have people within education, economics. It's, it's a broad group of people that you're writing these proposals to. So you have to have enough detail, but make sure that it's understandable by a large number of people. Um, again, make sure that you address all of those required categories. Um, Beth talked about the three legs, um, and we want you to specifically say how you are addressing those three legs, that social sustainability website that was up on, um, that's on the website is very useful. You know, for me, I am a soils person. I didn't start thinking about the social sustainability aspect until I became a part of SARE. And so those resources are very beneficial in me and thinking about those types of things. So utilize those um, when writing your proposals. And then finally, you know, it is, as Beth stated, it is a grassroots grant program. And so involvement of producers or the end user of the research or the education that you're doing. It might not necessarily be a producer, but who are those end users that are going to impact um, sustainable ag? How are they impacted by the research that you're doing and how are they involved? Can you get them involved in the proposal? So for one example, you know, if you're doing some things that um, with livestock that have different treatments, what are some things that they've utilized and how might they like to address some of the treatments, those types of things. So however you can get that end user producer involved within your grant, um, I think is very beneficial for the grant, but it's also beneficial for you 
and thinking a bigger picture about how you address these things within your career. So um, I think those are kind of the notes that I took down. The, that long-term, make sure that if you're thinking about that long-term option, that before you commit to that long-term option, you have a conversation with Beth about what your ideas are. And if we, as a committee, would actually consider that to be long-term or just the base project that could be built upon for other projects. I think that's it, Beth. That's great. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, I think Shannon hit some really important points. So uh, that's really good. Um, we can take questions now. We'll take general questions uh, and then have Maria Marie pull up the website for projects.sayer if you're not familiar with it. But first, let's take some general questions. Marie, do you have some to pass along or? Yeah, there's several questions in the chat. Did you want me to read them to you? Yes. Okay. I don't have the chat up. Great. Um, first question, and I'm going to just use first names from people. So I apologize in advance if I don't get your name quite right. Um, the first question was from Alphonse, um, wondering if they can get the documents of this meeting to help share with others. Yes, Alphonse, I posted a link in the chat um, for where you can get a copy of this slideshow. Um, and. Uh, at downloadable as either the PowerPoint or as a PDF that has all the notes, um, as well as event, this is going to be recorded, this actual session um, as a video and then posted to that website as well as probably later today, hopefully. Um, so there's, there's going to be resources at that. Next question is from Haley, and this one's for you, Beth. Can projects incorporate both research and education components? Yes, and thank you for asking that because I left out a critical part of the presentation. So one of the things Sarah also uh, insists on is outreach or education. So even if you are doing a research project, yes, you should be including uh, outreach or education. We look to share that information with the end users. So yes, it should include both. You'll see there's a question uh, on the cover page that says, is this research focused or education focused? And kind of which one you mark kind of goes to that, what I was talking about with the outcomes. So for research focused projects, you might not have as many action outcomes from that. For an education demonstration project, the emphasis might be on those uh, measuring those changes in behavior or those action outcomes. So hope I hope that answers your question, Haley. And thank you for reminding me to say that. Next question is from Joseph, wondering, um, are consultant fees that work on a project a direct or indirect cost? Uh, those are direct costs. So indirect are just, um, and, and again, you can call us with questions about the budgeting, although, uh, you know, you're not doing a budget for this one. So, but, but, I understand that you are still going to be sketching things out on a worksheet, certainly for, for the application, in case you're with the hope that you will be invited for a full proposal. Um, so indirect costs are, are overhead costs. People call them different, different organizations call them different things, but that the overhead costs that the institution usually takes out, and it's 10%. So consultant fees, fees for service, those are all part of direct costs. Next question is from Naranyan. How do you value innovation or research of a, an illiterate farmer? How do you help substantiate his, her idea into research and education? So uh, it, that's a good question and one we have been struggling with. We have been, uh, thinking of, first of all, trying to make our, working to make our materials work for low literacy groups. We've talked about doing uh, video applications, not for this project, uh, but more for the farmer rancher project. Um, if you are asking this as a re researcher for how you would involve those farmers in your work, um, you know, you can do video things and that that can be a part of your proposal is that you are going to uh, 
produce videos for your audience, um, either if they are English as second language or um, don't read or write well. Um, so I hope that answers the question. That's kind of a general question, certainly something that's on our minds. Um, we currently, as an applicant uh, for the research and education program, we only accept proposals online. Uh, so you, you do have to have uh, that literacy baseline to apply to this grant program. And another question from Joseph, do proposals compete across SARE regions? Meaning if one project is similar to another project in another region, will they compete against each other or could they both be funded? They can both be funded. So we don't, we're pretty independent. We don't see the proposals from other regions. So that's all handled within our North Central region. Um, and in fact, I usually get a question the other way, which is two proposals that are similar that kind of want to cooperate. Do we have a way to see if they're both funded? And, and we don't. We don't have a way to go across regional boundaries very easily. Uh, to fund projects. So we usually just recommend that people, you know, apply in both areas or in both regions, um, but not make them dependent on getting funding in the other region. But uh, it, it would be fine to apply in both regions. We, we know once projects are funded. So pre-proposals, that's all confidential. Um, once a project is funded, it becomes public information. That's when we would know. Okay, and the next question is from Crystal. Do you have any grants that would be for international research and education? We do not. Uh, Sarah does not. We're a pretty small grant program and we don't have international, uh, don't fund international programming. And the next question is from Vinayak. Not to sound overconfident, but this is more of a timeline constraint on our side. We will need to be working on a full proposal draft earlier this winter. I was wondering if it's possible to make the full proposal guidance available to applicants in advance of the February date on that timeline. So we don't do that because it doesn't get approved until January, actually. But the call for proposals does not change drastically. I can't remember if we have a sample call for proposals. If you'll contact me, uh, I can send you last year's as a sample, knowing that that may not be exactly what the call will be when it's approved in January. I'm not sure that we post it because it is by invitation only. So don't, I don't, we don't have a sample up either, do we? We have a sample of the pre-proposal, but not of right. the call for full proposal. Yeah. Um, John asked me, asked if we can repost a link. I'm not sure which link you needed, John. Um, if I didn't get the link in the chat that you needed, can you just put in the chat which link you're referring to and I'll repost it? Um, question from Keith. Are there specific topics for research of high interest to, for Sarah North Central? Uh, we do not have priorities for research generally, and that is a discussion every year by our administrative council. Um, they feel that the good ideas come from the grassroots. So uh, I, I would just say in turn, we are a USDA program. Uh, if you've looked at the USDA's uh, priorities, you know that they are looking for things like climate resilience, those types of things. I think are of interest, but uh, we do not have priorities. And every year we fund a broad spectrum of projects. I don't know, Shannon, do you, I'll catch you off guard a little bit. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I guess, you know, what you said, we really try not to constrain what it is that people propose because it is such a broad group and, you know, um, innovative ideas that solve problems. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there is certain high priority areas. It's just really the targeted solving solutions or solving problems with solutions, you know, that are, that are applied. Thanks. 
Next question is from Sarah. For the methods section, are you looking for a timeline of when activities will take place or more of a high level summary of how pieces will fit together? Um, more that high level, not a timeline at the pre-proposal level. So at the full proposal level, a timeline would be helpful. Um, and it, it kind of depends, I guess, if you're doing an education only proposal, and that is part of your method and approach is kind of what's going to follow from one other thing, you could include the sequence of events. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Again, if it's more specific than that, um, you can please contact me and we can talk about it. From Keith. Any limitation on submitting one topic under research and another topic appropriate for farmer partnership during the same year? Uh, so do you, so I'm not sure if you're asking if you can submit two within the RNE pre-proposal process, which you actually can do that. Um, it's a little tricky, but you can do that. You can talk to me or, but if you're talking about submitting both an r and &E pre-proposal and a partnership grant program proposal, yes, you can. And I sometimes encourage people to do that. Um, for one thing that again, I forgot to mention, the research and education proposals, the funding's due is available November 1st, 2023, partnership, uh, proposal funding is available April 1st, 2023. So you, you get a start ahead of the growing season. So yes, you can apply for both the 2023 partnership and the r and &E pre-proposal. You find out at the same time. So you'll find out if your proposal for partnership is funded and you'll find out if your pre-proposal is being invited for a full proposal uh, in early, mid-February to late February. Question from Joseph. If we have partners, is it best to put letters of intent in the pre-proposal or in the proposal process? In the proposal, no attachments in the pre-proposal. It's a very simple pre-proposal. We don't even ask for a CV. We uh, just ask for uh, CVs for the PIs. We just ask for, um, I think, a, a short bio that's within the proposal itself. Um, from Gabriel, can small businesses that partner with farmers are approved for government contracts through SAM and are conducting fundamental applied research apply for this grant? Yes, probably. Call me. So it can go to private entities. So um, yes, I, I would just say the one thing we sometimes run into with that is we don't do product testing. So if you're testing one specific product, that could be an issue. And then Gabriel's follow-up question was, additionally, is it encouraged to orient research towards long-term projects if they can be or not? Um, again, call me. So it is, um, the only thing I'll say about the long-term projects and Shannon is smiling, it's a tough cut. So this is basically our administrative council, uh, you know, promising future money to go to this research. So they're tough on them. So I, certainly if you have a project that qualifies for that and can go, you know, get additional funding without having to go through the application process, that's a great thing. But they are really tough on it. We do have at the pre-proposal level, the ability to change your mind. Like they can look at it and say, this is a good pre-proposal, but it is not a long-term proposal. And then you could, if we invite you, you could come back as a short-term proposal. If you apply at the full proposal level for long-term, you're either funded long-term or you're not funded. So it's a little complex. Uh, we've been working it out as we go along. We think we've settled on this as the way it works best. And you just touched on this a little bit. Stephen asked, when you look at long-term funding, can the proposal go beyond 250,000? And what would you consider long-term? So the way the long-term works, and, and I think we sort of spell this, we do spell it out in the call for proposals. 
is you get funding for the first cycle for 250,000 for, for the first three years. And then uh, we'll do a review. We, we're talking about doing site visits, kind of a pretty rigorous review to make sure you're making progress as you'd hoped. And then we'll give you a new contract for another three years. So you write out a new work plan for the rest of the work for the next three years for an additional 250,000. And we talked about that being, it could either be two cycles or it could be three cycles. So it could be six to nine years and you would get 250,000 for each of those three year cycles. Um, Hallie asks, if we have data that needs further analysis to allow us to best conduct the education component, does that further data analysis count as a research component? Um, I, uh, maybe, it, it could. I mean, it could be part of the work you put in. I would still say it's an education focused proposal. And, and I will say that education focus does not have to have research in it. So um, yeah, you would just kind of explain that, I think, in your in your pre-proposal. And a question from Jen. Do we need a formal commitment from each of the farmers to be a part of the project proposed in the grant for the farmer rancher involvement section? or just a list of potentially interested farmers based on past partnerships? Uh, so I'm gonna answer in between those two. So you don't need a formal letter um, because we don't have attached, but you will at the full proposal level, you will need those letters verifying participation. At the pre-proposal level, you can list. We, we do like to have you list them and maybe have spoken with them at least and, and have an idea that they'd like to be involved so we know who they are. And also because sometimes you think you'll get farmers involved and then they're really busy and you're unable to. So we do wanna have them identified. I think what we say in the call for proposals is uh, identified or tell us why you can't identify them at this time but you don't need letters from them. You will at the full proposal level. And that is the end of the questions in the chat, Beth. That's Lots of thank yous. Well, um, does anyone else have any questions before we move on to like this next section? We still have about 60 participants on the, on the Zoom right now. Okay. One last question came straggling in in the chat from Mitchell. Can you talk about the Youth Educator Grants? So I could, but uh, so I'll just say they're, they're small grants, they're $6,000 and they are to go to um, a, a someone who is teaching sustainable ag concepts. Um, but there is a webinar scheduled for the Youth Educator Program. And I don't know, Marie, do you have your calendar up? Can you look? Yeah, I can put the link in the chat actually. Okay, that'd be great. So I would suggest you tune in for that. And Joan Benjamin, uh, that call for proposals is also listed on our North Central SEER website. So please go pull that up. Joan's contact information is there. And then also I would suggest you register for that webinar. So thank you everyone for making the time. I know it's a busy time of year. I appreciate it. Uh, contact me if you have specific questions about your idea. I hope we get a bunch of pre-proposals. For those of you who haven't been in SARE projects or projects.sare.org, our online system, and would like to just see what it looks like, the next thing I'm gonna do is have Marie just pull that up, open it up for maybe the next five minutes and, and look so you see what it is. Uh, but for those of you who don't need that or can navigate the online system on your own, we don't use grants.gov. So I will say it's our own online application system. Um, you, you're welcome to stay on the line, but for the rest of you, thank you uh, for joining us. And we look forward to getting your pre-proposals. Okay, I think we've I had a couple other questions sent to me in the chat, which I think I've addressed. Okay. So I will pull up. I've already logged in, Beth. So that's okay. So when, when you go to projects.sare.org, uh, and, and again, we have screenshots of all of this in the online uh, PDF of my presentation. So 
what I took out of the slide deck that I went through today were the screenshots of every step of the program of applying. So you will see those there as well. Uh, and the first thing you do is you log in and you do an account. You have to answer some demographic information and some institutional information. Uh, and then you're in the system. And then once you're registered, so Marie has registered and she wants to start a new grant proposal. And this is for the whole system. So one of the things you need to make, go ahead, Marie. So one of the things you need to do is make sure you pick our region uh, we all have different grant application times. Um, so you wanna make sure you pick the North Central Region and you wanna pick for this one, the R&E pre-proposal. So now note that the rest of the ones that are open are in there. So someone asked about the youth educator, you could start one there. You could pull down the call for proposals there as well. And the partnership grant is the other one that I suggested you consider as well. Not as much money, uh, but higher success rate. Uh, so go ahead and open the begin a new proposal uh, under, yep, yeah, thanks, Marie. Hey, your internet's slow today, Marie. <laughs> Maybe because I'm hosting the Zoom while I'm- That, that could be <laughs> it. <laughs> Well, it, it will go a lot faster on your <laughs> system, I think. So usually it doesn't take that long. I don't recommend trying to fill out your proposal while you're hosting a Zoom. There we go. <laughs> so this is, this is what it looks like. So you'll see um, your project title, project coordinator is in there. Uh, you can keep scrolling down, Marie. So yeah, you can hold it there. So view draft at any time, if you want to look at what you're writing and what it looks like, which won't, there won't be anything there now, but uh, you can use that. It also give, gives you a link. So you cannot have collaborators go in and work on your same proposal. So there's just, there's one law, unless you give them your login information. So, but you can share your draft with collaborators. So that will also give you a link that you can send to them so they can look at it. Um, yeah, but they can't go in and make changes on your proposal unless you give them your login information. So as I said, there's a cover section, uh, you know, that you open up and just fill out kind of that standard information that you normally fill out. The impact on sustainable agriculture in the North Central region um, you could go ahead and open that up, Marie, because again, I told you to think about how your proposal uh, fits those three areas, and you have to come up with something, so because uh, you have to explain how it will affect it economically, environmentally, and socially. And again, the red asterisk means that those are required sections that you have to complete. Once you complete it, you get a green check that lets you know you can move forward. And you'll see down there in the bottom right, you got you can move to the next section, uh, which would be the body of the proposal. You can go back to the previous section, which was your cover page, your overview. You can view the draft. Uh, so a lot of nice buttons. This is a system that got set up for us about, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, three years ago, I guess now, that we've just been really happy with it. So I hope you'll find it easy to use as well. And then again, the body. Um, which goes through those main sections that I talked about, the project summary, and there are word limits for most of these that are, they'll be listed when you open the section, uh, but they are also listed um, in the call for proposals. So I will say one thing to remember to do, so if you type in all 250 words and forget to hit save down there at the bottom, you will lose it. So it's not so bad in these small pre-proposals, but uh, when you're putting a budget together, we tell people just save every time. If you get called away from your computer, it will not have saved what you've written unless you click on save. So as you can see, Marie answered that uh, and now she's got a green check. When you have all those required aspects, uh, filled out in a certain section and you go back to the overview, you'll have a green check by that part. Uh, 
Yeah, I think you can go back to the, I'm, I know I'm kind of racing through this again, all those screenshots are in that PDF that's available on the North Central SARE website along with the call for proposals. So you will notice there is not a submit button here. You do not get the submit button until you have green checks by all those required components. Um, so once those are completed and you have green checks, you will have a submit button there. Uh, and then you can click on it and submit it. You can also now unsubmit your application if you, you know, read through the draft after you've submitted and you see there's a problem before the deadline, you can unsubmit, just make sure you resubmit before the deadline, which is again, Thursday, October 13th at four o'clock. So that's the system. It's not, sometimes people get confused. This is separate from our website, the North Central SARE website. This is projects.sare.org. That, uh, that link is plastered big throughout the call for proposals. So uh, you hopefully won't miss that. My contact information is also in the call for proposals. Um, I think those are the main points of applying in the system. Uh, so again, if you have questions, you can either contact the NCR SARE office, uh, Jean can sure help you through the uh, application process, um, contact questions or proposal um, application online system questions, you can ask me as well. Um, there is on the online application, if you have technical problems, things are loading too slowly or something like that, or you think you've done something right and technically the system doesn't seem to be working, you can also email projects at sarah.org. And that's again in the system itself. And they are really good about trying to fix technical glitches um, and, and getting you in the system. I see we I don't know if you can hear the tapping outside. So we are, uh, our building is being re-roofed and they, they've just decided right outside my office to start pounding. So I think that's a good indication. It's a good time to end the webinar. Are there any other questions? <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I know. If, if not, uh, Thank you, Shannon, Aaron, and Marie for uh, helping to put this on. Thank all of you for attending. And again, we look forward to getting pre-proposals from you. <laughs>